Hello, Scott. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for taking some time to meet with me. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. It's about 11 a.m. here in Canada. I understand you're in Northern Europe. What time is it there? Oh, it's uh, 8, 8 p.m. Well, that's not yeah. too bad. That's yeah, not too bad. yeah. So, so Scott, so I've been watching. You. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I've been watching your channel for quite some time. Actually, <laughs> you introduced me to this one guy, Sergey Yurko. I see you also subscribe to him, and I through you actually subscribe to a guy that's uh, mm -hmm. developing some interesting solar tech. So I fell in love with just you sharing knowledge about greenhouses. And what brought me actually to you is that I'm combining a greenhouse with a thermal mass home. So I'm so excited to just connect with you and ask you a few questions. You've been doing such amazing research. Well, I, I mean, I, I have my own greenhouse, don't get me wrong, but a lot of things that I put on the channel, I haven't done myself. That being said, I've either researched them or seen them in person. And I have incorporated a lot of it into my greenhouse and we're building more. So that gives you some background and idea of what exactly I'm doing. The philosophy of my channel from the start has been how to do this primarily for a greenhouse, but how to do it with what I like to call ROI or return on investment. Uh, in our climates, as you know, it gets awfully cold in winter and the biggest concern is heating whether it's a residence or a greenhouse or anything like that. And with heating, there's things like thermal mass, insulation, um, solar gain, that kind of stuff. But that being said, you can do almost anything if you have an unlimited budget. And the biggest thing that's held me back, and you see it often in my comments, is you'll get engineers or people going, oh my God, I can do this so much more efficiently. But you're building it at $300 a square foot. I'm trying to build something at $10 a square foot. Um, when I do a business, I don't like to put a lot of money into it until the business itself can pay for it. I mean, it's nice if you're massively profitable and you can get uh, a glass greenhouse that's built absolutely perfect with everything on it. But I'd like to be able to build something in the middle of nowhere in a climate like we have here where it gets down to 40 below that works and do it at 10 to $15 a square foot. Suddenly you have a, a business that you can pay off in one to two years. And, and that's, you know, if you buy buy and build something and it takes you 20 years to pay it off, who are you working for? The bank or yourself? Exactly. So that's been the philosophy Scott, of everything I've done. I love your strategy. And I think it's the perfect strategy because I am fully, fully there. I harvest rubbish, <laughs> which can be used for building, of course, inspired mm -hmm. by earthships, uh, fantastic foundations out of tires. Um, I use earth bag uh, predominantly, as you can see in my drawing behind, uh, which is 10 parts earth from underneath my feet and one part uh, cement. And uh, yeah, even car windows, because those literally got a little crack on them and they're fantastic uh, windows. If you could put two of them in cob, I haven't done that. And just like yourself, some things I've done uh, in a warmer climate, and uh, I've just built a, a, um, a, a vault in Siberia, um, which was uh, for a thousand dollars for all the building materials. So I'm game That's on awesome. not getting into debt. In fact, I've lost my home to a bank in South Africa after halfway into payments, 12 and a half years into payments. I, oh, I, that hurts. I, yeah, I didn't want to do what I was doing it when I started. Obviously, you can't plan to 30 years ahead. And I just had to walk out of it with all the investments I've done. And in fact, I've paid it already once over. But because of credit, you pay the, the, the percentage okay. first and then not the capital amount. So anyway, I've lost a, my home previously. So I'm there with rather doing it cheap, rather starting small, less space. But you know what? It's yours and your land. So, I mean, I'll be honest, I just became familiar with your channel in the last week and I started looking at different things on there. And I'm going to tell you, one of the things I'm so impressed with is that you looked at what's happening with Earthships and I think you were even involved in building some of them. But on your stuff, I don't see you using the tires. I see you using earth bags, which I think is smarter. Um, I've always had a bit of an issue with the tires myself because of the amount of work that's required to stuff everything into them and put them on there. The, the term I like to use is you need a gaggle of hippies to put this together. And not everybody has access to uh, this amount of free labor. And if the labor is not free, suddenly the costs that they're talking about go through the roof. 
So I love yeah. the earth bags and yeah. what you're doing. They're much simpler. You can do them with one or two people. Um, uh, you can set the the depth, like how wide the earth bag is to whatever you want based upon what kind of earth bag you're doing. All in all, you took what I thought was some of the best aspects of the earth ships and incorporated it into what you're doing to make it more cost effective and better. Yeah, wow. Thanks for that comment. Actually, it's very true what you, what you said because uh, I've done four rows of tires above ground plus one row as a foundation and I gave up. And that wasn't nearly like <laughs> an 800 that. square foot. It not, wasn't an 800 square foot or, like, or a 1,000 square foot airship. I, I gave up because I'm 41. Uh, I did have COVID. So my lungs are not of, you know, whatever people, we, maybe we should cut this out. but. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had I had a bit I of my illness in my lungs, and uh, I can't breathe just as much as I used to before that. And the problem with pounding tires is that you have to bend down, bend down with a sledgehammer, and uh, a lot of work. Can, like, only can do four tires per day, and 24. you can't automate it. That's the worst part: is you actually can't get some sort of hydraulic system to do this. Unless you want to spend a million dollars designing something, it's that complicated. It's got to be done manually. Yeah, there was a system, mind you, one needs to, maybe we can find that little video shot, but the guy picked up one of those, uh, uh, trom, uh, you know, trom, what is it, stomping devices, the, I don't know what yeah. it's called, and he picked it up on a backhoe, <laughs> and he moved it over the tire, and then, you know, he got, you know, he got them pretty Massively quick that way. But still, <laughs> where, where is the backhoe? <laughs> I don't have a backhoe. So I'm developing homes as simple with low tech tools, with just as you said, one or two guys. Two guys is a good team because it Beautiful. really speeds you. And four that's times. reality. Most people have access to them and their wife or them and their brother or their friend or something like that. And they don't have access to a gaggle of hippies to help them put something together. Yeah. Like so my I'd, purpose since the beginning yeah. has actually been cost, not eco-friendly. Not that I'm against eco-friendly, but if you can't feed your family, eco comes second after being able to build it and do it affordably. It's very interesting that you said that because I find that people from northern cold climate <clears throat> think somewhat differently. Because if you're in California or South Africa, where planting season is nine months of the year, you kind of like take it easy and you like, let's Zen on it, let's meditate, let's connect with the universe's highest being. But here, before you know it, boom, everything is in frost, water is frozen, ground is frozen, you hit a spade with the ground, it bounces off. Winter <laughs> is like, coming. Oh God. <laughs> Say it again? It's like Game of Thrones where the, the, the theme is winter is coming. <laughs> yeah. It, I, call it, I call it the hardcore reality check. So, yeah, it's different. So let's get into some of the ideas that you've been going on. I mean, I sent you a list of a couple of things I'd like to discuss. And I think we're on very similar pages to a lot of this, but I, I love what with, you're with, doing. With pleasure. Can you see this uh, screen? Yes. And the stuff you're doing I'll, is so visually appealing. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, I kind of combined, I could say, an earthship with uh, domes and uh, Gaudi. Really love the curves. And I haven't, I'm not going to go, if we have time, I can go back into the rest of the presentation, how I started with stretch spandex and all of that. But I really want to get into the meat of bar architecture. So basically, yeah, I learned at Cal Earth, learned at uh, uh, Dome uh, Gaia with Aircrete. And I kind of been doing like these curves and traveling the world with large windows, designing homes with large windows out of these two methods. And then, um, you know, something dawned on me, but what happens if we uh, attach a bit of a greenhouse? I've always been fascinated with earthships. In fact, I went to Taos in 2011 and in 2013, mm -hmm. I, I built, I uh, had the opportunity gorgeous. to build with Mike Reynolds. Um, <clears throat> so I thought, well, what, what happens if we start, you know, here you can see a bit of my fabric days. I was actually testing quarter geodesic dome uh, in my, through my exhibition design. What happens if we attach a bit of a greenhouse to a, a, a vaulted space, especially if it's made of mass? So this is some of my first earlier designs, and then I made some models. Just like yourself, I haven't built a full-scaled earthship 
yet. I've built a vault, which I'll show you, and, and I've built um, uh, some holes <clears throat> in warm pockets. Um, but many designs and through models, I find very good to, to, to actually do these little one to 10 scale because you realize that this fancy thing on top is not going to work, it all flops down. So models are great. Um, so yeah, it's just been incorporating geodesics because um, because they're easy to build. Geodesic domes are those low tech well, let me things. Give that you an build. idea of the two greenhouses I've built here. I built one that's a dome. You may have seen it in some of my videos, but I also mm -hmm. started building a Quonset hut type one, and both were built off of plans from a guy out of England named Paul Robinson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, or yes, yes, yes. So he's got some incredible stuff online for building domes and things like that. But here's the interesting thing on my dome versus my Quonset hut. My dome has been up, I don't know, four or five years now. I'm over 300 pounds. I'm six foot three. I'm a big bugger. And I can hang off the top of my dome. And I only built it with small, thin electrical conduit because I got it on, they had a blowout sale at Home Depot one day and I got it crazy cheap. Mm -hmm. and this isn't really thick material or anything like that. But in the dome, I can hang off of it. It'll hold that much strength. But if I go to the Quonset hut, it doesn't even hold itself up. Like I yeah, use the plans to always... call and, uh, and that's a thing for cold climate. We we have to consider the snow load. The snow load can be so heavy that I've seen some of these greenhouses literally squashed after a big snowfall. The next morning, they're all lying and flat. Wins. I mean, I'm of the and opinion wins. that you can't build something that can withstand a 60 mile an hour, 100 kilometer an hour wind. There's no point in having it because you're going to yeah. get a bad day and goodbye greenhouse. So, I mean, yeah, that, I'm a fan that, of the Quonset hut idea. Don't get me wrong. But it mm -hmm. needs more material in structure to get the same strength as a dome. Quite a bit more. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that's why I love geodesic domes. But I don't use them as a full dome. I use them as a as a as a half, half a half a quarter of a sphere. So you actually, I love what you're as doing. you see, beautiful. Yeah. So there's me, myself and my wife. We're digging a foundation. So eventually, it gets drawn on the ground. Um, and here I'm developing something interesting. Uh, it's an air channel because uh, in order for these homes to work, I need to be able to, I'll show you just now in the next one of the next drawings. I'm basically taking the hot air from the greenhouse and instead of dumping it like an earthship does, I want to take uh, some of that heat into the berm burial. So I'm testing different things, but what this plastic roll is here, I haven't tested it yet. Is basically we're gonna blow it up on a bungee jumping uh, uh, fan, and I'm gonna yeah. uh, attach it with a mesh, with a, a stucco type of mesh. Uh, I think it's a fiberglass mesh uh, on this foundation, on on the snake foundation made of a sandbag, with some nails to the side, and then I'm gonna use a hopper gun to spray a thin layer of cement and sand mix over this blown up plastic chute with the mesh and uh, um, and to create a channel that's a catenary shaped arch. Does that make sense? Yeah, somewhat. I okay, like so basically I'm, I'm gonna create my own channel. Otherwise, what else are we gonna use? Stainless steel or some other expensive tubing? I wanna be able to design my own tubing that can take even the heat. If I wanna be able to send hot air down through the, you know, through the floor, I can from the stove. So, so I like that. The, the one issue I've had with that, and I've kind of moved away from the idea myself in, in designs of having the heat underneath the greenhouse because cooling becomes an issue in summer if you've got your heat underneath you. Um, yes. There seems to be this idea among a lot of greenhouse builders on the passive greenhouses that we got to take whatever heat the sun gives us inside the greenhouse and use it. And I've kind of come to the idea that I'd rather regulate the heat and blow it out if I have too much and have my, my thermal battery outside the house, even though it might need to be a slightly bigger. But the, the thermal I, the thermal battery like Scott, the, is outside is outside the house. Uh it's something that I'm experimenting with a, a different air uh, uh, that that absolutely. air channel that I was showing you is for fire. It's for fire in in winter time. So I could stoke right. the fire low and have the heat go underneath the floor, warming yeah, up. Yeah, and hold the thermal mass for that. Mass. The, the, the biggest problem I've always had, it's close to what a climate battery is, but it works for what you're doing. Like, I mean, and I think you're on the right path there. I mean, for, the, for, for me, the large thermal battery that I want to draw for heat, 
I've always felt I like. Have, are you familiar with Drake Landing in Alberta? Uh, no, it's a, it's no, a housing it's... community. It's something you should maybe look up. What they did was they took fifty-five homes, and they put um, solar collectors, thermal solar collectors, on all the garages, and sent it all to one central big borehole that they dug into the ground and heated it up, and they use it <clears throat> seasonally, storing the heat to heat all the homes and they're actually able to get something like 99 percent of all their heat now if not 100 percent. okay it. so scott here is the first question yeah. does that borehole have to be insulated from outside of that outside ground uh you know all around yes and so no. what bore, what um drake landing did is the borehole is so big that it doesn't necessarily need because it's doing 55 homes and the width and girth uh, the, the insulation of insulating it from the ground is done just by its size itself when doing it for okay. an individual home i agree with you on the idea that it needs to be insulated but i also think you're on the right path in using things like aircrete a lot of people will use aircrete for construction and don't get me wrong i think it's good and it works but to me the biggest value in aircrete is insulation yes Yes, yes. And there is a fellow on YouTube that started combining polystyrene, shredded polystyrene that he gets for free from towns. And he shreds yeah. it with this uh, lawnmower upside down. And he mixes those acreage and gets tremendous R value literally for nothing. Yeah. This is, by the way, the vault that I built for $1,000 on material. This whole thing That's cost me $1,000. And it can That's take 10, 10 tons per square meter. Uh, C-grade wood, uh, which we shaved ourselves, log, uh, logs, all those logs we got out of the forest, and those were dry logs. We didn't kill one tree, uh, well, for the for the walls. The logs were taken dry and mm -hmm. dead, we, uh, and we cleaned them up. Um, yeah. So basically, just to explain the concept, can you see the slide? This bottom yeah, right, can you see it? So it's it's one of my it's a three designs back already, <laughs> but basically we're gonna take the hot air from the highest point, channel yeah. it down using that fat pipe. It comes down to a blue barrel, a two hundred liter barrel, and spreads underneath the greenhouses. And that's what I'll consider what you said about not overheating the greenhouses. There is a septic it heats up the septic with septic likes being warm, being you know bacteria and stuff, and. Mm -hmm. Even short of it, basically, all of those is taken to a burial berm behind the home. So these tires, uh, are still my old design, as I said, but these tires, basically, yeah. it, the burial is held up until this wall. All of this is buried, um, you know, and that's obviously insulated. And uh, I'll show you a little pe pencil sketch now so you can see. But um, And then these are the two cold pipes, making sure that the cold air comes in. But that's exactly like an airship system, and the cold air comes in insulation, so that warmth of the of the berm is not heating our cold yeah. pipes. Now that you, yeah. you've really got this down nicely on a lot of things that you're doing. Um, so and to, get into to some, take what you ahead. said, to take what you said about uh, not overheating the greenhouse, I want to have a basically a, a black pipe somewhere up uh, at the at the top of the greenhouse and channel mm -hmm. that air through into the burial. And one last thing I didn't show you, because the question is, are you going to be running a fan all day long? <clears throat> no, I'm not. I'm planning to use two solar tubes. So if you look at my hands, polycar uh, uh, like a mirror behind, like some flexi mirror. Uh, in front uh, is the polycarbonate. Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. then that 60 meter, uh, one foot diameter, 30 centimeter diameter uh, black pipe. Yeah, that runs from top to bottom there. And basically, I'm planning that if it's sized correctly, it will create a draft because so much heat. Just create a suction and pull all the warm air from the greenhouse through the burial. And, and then we're going to exhaust it out through this. So it's going to come out nice and cool, leaving all the warmth in the burial. And the burial will stay dry because just like the John Hayes so that's cool. uh, umbrella hole, Yes, uh, insulated now, now and dry. I'm, I'm going to run one question with you there, though. I mm -hmm. like the idea that it's doing a natural draw and going everything on that. But how mm -hmm. is that? Uh, let's get back to one of my founding things that I, I believe in for my site is ROI. How does that? I, I think that'll work. But how does that compare to just sticking a fan on it? Okay, the I mean, problem with the fan is that we always 
we're always reliant on tech. And I like the idea of uh, a passive home. And passive home is not a fan going okay, on all, all the time. It, we will start it with a fan. There is a fan, mm -hmm. that little worm here, this little red worm yeah, here. Yeah. That's that that little nugget, like an egg. <laughs> that's actually underneath the sauna. There it is, that little worm, okay? <clears throat> that's inside the sauna. And the sauna is this constantly hot space. That's that super Adobe sandbag uh, so, unit inside the cylinder. Let me give you one thing just to consider when you're talking about natural convection. And mm -hmm. I'm going to use my house, my, my own house. I have a wood boiler here and uh, it, uh, radiators that we have around the house, and it works. But I can only heat my house to about minus 10 with the radiators unless I put a fan on them. And when I put a fan on my radiators, I'm good to minus 25. So it gives you an wow. idea of the efficiency difference. I, I, I be that much, but it is. I mean, we live with this and we've had it for a few years now. I literally can go 15 degrees Celsius colder just by adding a small fan. And I'm not talking something major, like the fans that I use are tiny that I add to them. But Okay. Okay. The so they're not taking a lot of electricity. Of no. In fact, hang on one second here. I'm going to grab one and I'll show it to you. That's right here. I'm going to stop share so I can have you on the screen. Sorry about that. So I don't know if you can see this. There. This is the fan that I use because I got right outside my door is one of my blowers. You see? So what do you blow on? that on? I blow it on a radiator. And it's just a small little radiator. And it works. Just let me put the fan down. Give me one second here. Okay. Sorry about that. So it blows on. I have three different main um, heat register radiators. The radiators that I have actually kind of look like a baseboard, an electric baseboard, but they're really, um, you can look them up online. They're really just a-, um, a Like a radiator. car radiator, like has lots of little- uh, Exactly, little foil. exactly, exactly. And it has hot water going through it and heats it up. Now it, it's designed to work by convection, but the efficiency and how much it puts out by adding that little fan. Sorry, my dog wants out here. Gotta take care of your pooches. Um, it's phenomenal. okay. So what, basically, what you're saying is, you, you you blow any excess heat off that thing, so it cools down and it gets more heated uh, faster. Yeah. Whenever it's colder, we turn the fans on. But when it's not that cold, because it kicks out so much heat, we don't. We just turn the fans off. You know, okay. our, our our system. I don't even have my house on a thermostat system. My wife likes to have the window open at night when it's not that cold. But not that cold using a wood boiler means minus ten Celsius. Um. And we produce so much extra heat, it's not a problem. But uh, like I said, I'm just saying the amount of heat that you're going to move with a little fan. And I understand it involves technology, but a solar panel and a tiny battery will run that thing 24 hours. That isn't going to cost a huge amount. Okay, so the that, of that brings me to another challenge that I didn't speak of here in Northern Europe. Uh, it is overcast for two months of the year. So what airships can achieve in Taos by the sun blazing through that into the back into that mass room, we don't have that. November and December, it's literally it's like the sun comes up How's at ten, wind? goes. How's your wind? Is that again? How's oh, the wind. wind? Yeah. Uh, no, not 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 a hell of a lot. Not a hell of a lot that we could ca catch that on. So if we're talking about a totally off grid solution, look, one could put something yeah. into the boiler. That could create a bit of a generator, you know. That that's also uh, a possibility. But uh, I do want to use. See, my system is slightly different. I don't have a radiator. I have these uh, pipes that <clears> basically <throat> take the heat from the top of the greenhouse in summer and they channel it into this huge two hundred ton excavator buried uh, berm behind the home, yeah. as you said, separate yeah. to my greenhouse. So yeah. the greenhouse, the home and the burial, I'll show you now from top. And basically, I, I, that burial is insulated, not allowing any of the cold heat to come out. So it can only go one way. But right. now I have another challenge because I'm heating up my back burial so hot my whole summer. Not So Earthship just gets blasted by the sun and it gets heated. Right. I and, and Earthship dumps all the heat from the greenhouse, correct? They have this huge yeah. skylight and just creates draw and it pulls up cold air through the pipe, that cold pipe metal, uh, yeah? And then it sucks it and throws it all into atmosphere. What I'm doing is slightly different. Yes, I'm gonna have that extraction uh, skylight on a, a automatic 
wax, uh, paraffin, yeah, those work well. thing. Yeah, yeah. So when I reach like 30 Celsius, it it so it doesn't overcook yeah, my plant. It just auto, auto but, opens and it all but instead of before the temperature, I want to take that heat and take it through into my burial. So it's not like I use a I can use a fan to get the whole thing started. Like you know, in cold climate, you use sometimes a newspaper to get a cold plug out of the pipe, you know, blast it out, so it creates yeah, a yeah. draw. And until then, it's just the smokers going into your house. So it's basically you create that effect, but in summer, and then when the sun is shining, okay. And then and then once it's rolling, I want the hot, the hot pipe to just pull that air right out. So my system is slightly different, although I love the radiator idea, and I definitely want to compile, combine the radiator water system and my hot air in the berm system uh, don't get me wrong i use a radiator system because <clears throat> of the house i got here if you want the if you're building from scratch you should be using radiant floors that that's my two cents um if you start looking at the efficiency of how heat pushes out radiant floors are often twice or three times as efficient meaning you need a lot less heat to give you the same amount of heat inside so uh, and i use a radiant floor in my greenhouse whereas my house i have radiators because i couldn't really rebuild the floors um it's amazing. you use is, you use radiant floor in your greenhouse yes i do i actually have a video on that and how i built it and i did it incredibly cheap <clears throat> most people would pour concrete to do it what i did is i poured sand stuck the the pex tubing which is the radiant uh delivery system and then i got free sidewalk blocks and i put them on top the sidewalk oh. blocks basically are concrete they heat right up because they're on the warm sand but I didn't have to buy and pour concrete. And concrete is not cheap. I yeah, mean, if you yeah. if you look at pouring for a house, I mean, depending on where you are here, you're looking at ten, twenty thousand dollars by the time you're done with the labor and the pour and all the rest of it. And sure, you can do it yourself. And it's not that hard, but it is to do it right because it's so easy to screw up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just exactly. pouring something simple and stupid, do it yourself. But if you're pouring for a house or a garage, you get professionals to pour that. Yeah, I got, I got you. And twenty thousand uh, uh, dollars. Not not everybody's got that just lying around. No. I, but I'm I, mean, I built to... mine for bugger all. I mean, I used free sidewalk blocks. The pecs was I don't know, hundred bucks or something. Uh, and uh, you use a little uh, little heat pump that circulates, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, taco nice. pump or something like that. And they're one hundred to two hundred bucks. They're nothing major. Yeah. I'll definitely check that video out. I just want to finish this quickly, the the, the yeah. little presentation. Um, it will also give us um, some... Uh, okay, so basically, so that's 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 this house design. And also, obviously, in order to build a home that, um, you know, warms up with the sun, you've got to take the angle of the sun and your area into account. How does it affect my design? Well, I'll, I will design the ceiling uh, at 20 degrees. So in, in October, sorry, November and December and January, there's very little sun. It's literally nine degrees off the horizon and it's overcast most of the time. But in February, when it comes <clears throat> out, here's the February line, okay? It, it's at 20 degrees. So I'm designing my roof uh, uh, at 20 degrees. Uh, so basically that February warm, warmish sun. <laughs> it's not, I mean, when a sun comes out in February, you know, it's like minus 30, but it's already a bit high. So if, you know, the sun does have a bit of warmth once it's inside the glazing, correct? So that's yes. how it affects. And a huge mass. This is where I'm really like taking Earthships a bit. Obviously that's, that's excavated. Yeah, yeah, three meters. Uh, three the meters question of mass. Got, well, I think you're doing it right is that you're you're actually putting, um, injecting heat into that mass because as soon as you go beyond two feet, it's really hard to radiate a lot of heat into it beyond that short term. But if you're injecting that heat into that mass that size, you're on the yes. Right path. That's what that's what all the, that <clears> pipe work that I'm, that I'm developing. That's uh, that's exactly what it's for. Another question I have for you, Scott. Uh, the skirting of insulation. I've thought of doing a skirt of insulation that goes out like this. I've seen some Canadian homes, the insulation goes straight down parallel with the foundation. With this skirt, it creates like an umbrella that I take a bit of mass around the home. What are your thoughts on that? It works. 
Um, the, the type of insulation you're going to put down depends upon what you have available to you, whether uh, one of the things I've done with that is um, when they're tearing down commercial buildings, you can get styrofoam, big styrofoam sheets cheap. I mean, styrofoam sheets that cost 60, 80 bucks, a four by eight sheet here, I've been able to get for five bucks used. And what do you care if you're sticking it in the ground if it's used or new for but, styrofoam? But what's your thoughts on going parallel mm -hmm. down with the foundation, just right next to the foundation, or grabbing a bit of earth extra around you? Um, I, I think you need to be close to the foundation and insulate it going down. Where you live, in my climate, you got to go down six to eight feet, but it's worth it. Um, there's a lot of cold that'll come in through the ground a lot so so and what you're saying is if i go with the skirt amount. if i go with the skirt going at an angle i'll have the cold climb underneath that skirt is that what you're saying think of it as just a fence and it keeps the the cold on one side and the warmer material underground on the other um you're going to prevent 10 degrees celsius loss or more depending upon how cold your ground gets okay and the I next mean, question scott further Do south I it's not as much an issue do I if I if, if I go let's say fine five, three four five feet down, do I still insulate underneath the the floor of my home or should I because there's mixed thoughts because if I don't insulate where you're going underneath... down is to the frost line, so below the frost line it's going to be zero and then five ten whatever your ground temperature is where you live. Okay, does that make okay. sense? So what yeah, you're but doing do I insulate is... underneath the home or just around the perimeter? If you want to go underneath, only if you're heating underneath the home and you want to hold that heat. Um, if gotcha. you're fine with 5, 10 degrees below, once again, it depends on your heating system and how much heat you want to save. You can have five feet of insulation everywhere heat. and it's great, but there's a limit. I mean, you have to look I at wanna, the I, 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 I can't have the ground stealing my heat, so then I have to insulate underneath. Yes, but it might be better rather than digging it all out and going underneath to do what I did with my mm -hmm. greenhouse. I put four inches of insulation just right on top of the ground, and then I put my sand on top of that. Yeah, yeah. Plus, we have also a very high water table. If I dig a four-foot deep hole, yeah. I'm going to have water in there, and I'll never be able water's to keep it Water is a big enemy for that. We have that same issue here. Okay. So basically, that's what it looks like when it's finished. Uh, um, I'm building a full, fully fledged product. Uh, my, yeah, it's it's buried up until that line, and it's got green, lush green jungle in the greenhouse. I might need to use a double greenhouse because uh, it's so cold polycarbonate. That even three walled polycarbonate, I don't think it will sustain it. And you're obviously aware of the Chinese greenhouse. I think I've seen something yeah, on your you're, channel. You're, I see right there. You're talking about thermal blankets, and that's the best way to go. Um, as soon as you go with polycarbonate into three and four and five layers, you lose 8% of your sunlight for every layer of polycarbonate. So it's yeah. not really that smart to go beyond double polycarbonate. Glass is great. You can do as much as you want, but of course your cost is going to go through the roof. People go, oh, I can get yeah. free glass. Yeah, but you got to frame it in. And the framing's not cheap when you come to glass too, because it requires a lot more in framing. Um, exactly. So whether exactly. it's a poly, that's an air inflated poly, which is by far the cheapest way to go or polycarbonate, which is a little more money, uh, the thermal blanket is, in our climates, it's, it's absolutely one of the most not considered and important things that you need to have in a greenhouse, especially if you can have it on the inside. The blanket. Yeah, of course, because yes. otherwise the snow is going to uh, completely jam the yeah. whole system. There's a, there's a guy in Saskatchewan okay. named Dong, a Chinese guy. I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff. He does huge uh, Chinese Yeah, in Canada. Yes, and it's beautiful. He's got a little vib system on the inside. He's got a little vibrator to the, to shake off the snow. Yeah, that was cool. <clears throat> that was really yeah. cool what he did on that. But outside of that, I mean, I can always scrape the snow off when it comes. I love how he put his insulating blanket on the inside. I don't know if you've yeah. seen so, that. Yeah. So, so besides the cold tech, I want to be able to build the vaults, the vaulted roofs using augmented reality it's the follow the program is called phonogram they basically the guys are putting the glasses on and they can see where exactly to put every single brick that way That's we cool. can build our homes without using form work um and that's this is the future of how i see um the biotexture organic liquid bioarchitecture with greenhouses cool. that stick out of these uh, all these big openings and they're extremely strong 
The guy is putting in four and a half thousand kilograms on one. I believe square that. Meter. Just my experience with my dome teaches me that the domes are incredibly strong. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to share that with you. Um, so a couple of the things I guess outside of insulation yeah. that I wanted to discuss is what what are you doing for water collection? Okay, so the water collection. This is what I'm thinking. Okay, so the airships have these very expensive metal roof. And I just thought, again, I want to go low tech just like yourself. So I thought, oh, if we have a grass grass roof, okay, which is, a, mm -hmm. you know, just a, like a hobbit home. Okay, it's flattish on top. So I can build in a ridge inside. And underneath the grass, uh, I want to have the water, waterproofing barrier like uh, like a plastic, something cheap. Three layers. I'm very inspired by John Haidt's book. I think I've sent it to you. Please have a look at it. It's in, incredible. It's the umbrella home. Okay. So I so basically it's a layer of plastic insulation, not thick. Layer of plastic insulation, layer of plastic. So even if one layer of plastic gets torn, um, then there is two more. Okay. So that's keeping the whole thing dry. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put sand on top of this, which acts as a natural filter. And then I'm going to put the grass turfs on top of that. So obviously not in winter, but in summer and autumn and spring, when it's like there is a lot of uh, moisture and, and water and rain, um, um, because the sand is got air particles, so, you know, it's less dense. I'm hoping that as the water gets through the turf, which is already acting as a little bit of a cleaning mechanism, um, <clears throat> the sand gets through the sand and then it gets cleaned out and obviously behind in my burial, in the coldest part, I'm going to have a water tank. And the cheapest water tank that I've learned that you could do, uh, because obviously anything you bury has to be this proper water tank, which is expensive. But you can use a standard plastic cylinder tank if when you bury it around, you, you, you put soil around it and then you mix cement water and you pour around that and you just do a little compaction. So this cement water binds and it's called stabilized earth. Maybe you've heard of the yeah, term. I have. And basically ju just half a meter or <clears throat> two feet around this cheap, cheap tank, uh, two and a half thousand gallon, 10,000 liter tank. You basically sprinkle the cement water and you go up, up, up every one foot at a time, compacting. And that thing, if that water ever gets empty, the tank will not implode because you have a stabilized cylinder. Right. That's my thoughts. And obviously from that is a standard airship system, which is a delivery to a water organizing module, which I'll send you the lesson. I've made it already. It's very cool. It's 12 volt. Um, got a couple of filters on it. And then I've got a fantastic biochar filter that I've learned in Thailand from an American PhD guy called Josh Kearns. And biochar, we made our own biochar. First tank is um, gravel, cleaned, washed. Second is uh, sand, but big quantities, 100 liters. <laughs> 100 liters of sand, clean, washed, and 100 liters of biochar, clean, washed. Scott, the water coming out of the other end, I had it tested. It was 200 times better than standard city quality water. Biochar filtration. That's fabulous. I mean, the first thing I've always thought, and I, I got... How do I say this? I got my ass handed to me by a couple of people in my comments when I talked about this was why don't they just use a well? And I didn't realize that people don't have access to wells like we do here where I live. Um, if you have access to drilling a well and it's under 200 feet, my opinion is don't bother with any of that crap. Uh, drill the well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's on and off. It's tap water. I mean, just put a filter on it. You're done. But there's a lot of places that that isn't a possibility. They got to go a thousand feet or more, or it's just not there. And the cost of those wells is absolutely phenomenal. So then it falls back into what you're talking. So my, my only advice in looking at it from that standpoint is if uh, you can drill a well under 200 feet, do it. If you can't, then this is how you go forward with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Scott, just uh, I, I was also looking at a well with a borehole pump. That's what it's called in South Africa. Uh, it's like this this diameter of six inches or so. And I thought yeah. it was going to cost me about two thousand dollars, but it's actually going to cost me ten thousand dollars. And I thought, nah, not right now. That's about but right. I, I'm going to do a five meter, fifteen foot well. It's those big concrete rings. 
Uh, yeah. it's, it's not really a well. I mean, what is it called? It's it's that old school thing that they used to do in the village days, like 200 yeah, I years back. I don't know if there's a term for it, but they, they call them wells as well. They call yeah. them wells as well, but it's not that uh, it's not this size. It's about uh, probably about four yeah. foot, uh, four yeah. foot or three foot wide. You can Wishing climb well in it. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and those things only go about fifteen foot uh, at tops. But next year, a bit more. You guess it depends what area you live in. But that water is not uh, drinking quality sometimes because right. especially if you're in an area where there's lots of other homes, everybody is pooping yeah. in their septics and yeah. so on yeah. and so Absolutely. forth. But I can build with that water and I can use it for technical purposes, like whatever. But the drinking water is what I spoke of. Just that I need a much smaller tank because that's just drinking, cooking, and yeah. and, and, and maybe even washing. So that's well, the I, I'm with you. And, and basically, you're following a lot of what the Earthships do out, outside of using uh, th this umbrella home system, which filters it a bit better, obviously. Um, that works. Um, what do you do with wastewater? <coughs> like, are, are you recycling it at all? You're pushing it into the food supply. There's been a lot of talk. Um, Just got repeat your places. question. What do I do with wastewater septic? Oh, oh no, that's an airship system going to be. Um, uh, the septic I'm going to use a, a cheaper septic, the cheapest, cheapest septic that I've done, and I'm doing everything super cheap and low tech, just like you. Uh, the cheaper septic is using truck tires, earthship style, big bus tires, big, okay, probably about four foot yeah, yeah. diameter, three foot massive, okay. And then there's about five of them in the plastic lined uh, well, <laughs> okay, and then with some rocks around that. And then basically the pipe goes right through in the middle. And then you put a little ferrous cement dome and then pour a straight slab. And then the toilet goes straight on top of that. Okay. And that's a septic. I might add a bit of oxygenation, uh, but that's a separate Which story. Is, and that goes through a botanical cell in this greenhouse behind me. So the pl the plants such as bulrushes and and uh, and uh, other water plants are going to clean that water up. And I have had good experience with in South Africa, not in cold climate, in South Africa with yeah. uh, getting my water from septic. In fact, biogas, a biogas digest. I had the fire going. And then from that biogas digest, I had the water, I stuck my hand in it, there was no smell. It was a 14 meter long, about 36, 40 foot long wetland, botanical cell that I made. Yeah, it worked. Amazing. Those are cool. We don't get into a lot of septic with the greenhouse side. It's more just the water for watering and going forward. But um, I, I find that interesting to look at how different people approach that and go forward with it. I live in a rural area where you know, the, the two main options that we have for septic here are either holding tanks where a truck comes and pulls it out or a septic field. And I mean, the fields work better with an aerator, like like you had mentioned, um, if you have on your pre-tank, um, a, a way to to push that. Although there has been a couple issues with smell. Like I have an RV park and everything here because of size and what we're doing is all tanks um, that are hauled up by a truck but it's hauled to a, a municipal place that then biologically aerates it and processes it before it puts it back into the natural environment yeah so so the problem with just putting it into a leach field is that the in in my case <clears throat> in the ocean case the plants roots in the gravel uh get into contact and the water goes through and actually there is no smell if it's sized correctly there is no smell at all because yeah. the plant's cleaning up the water. The leach field literally drops it onto a field through a st lots of... I like that pipe. idea. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm in essence building a, like a, a, an academy of bioarchitecture that I can invite kids and teenagers to come and experience how nature you know, treats our water and heats our homes up using no fireplace. I'm really aiming to try and get these homes to operate in Canada with no fireplace. At all. I like that. Don't get me wrong. I, I think you're on the right path. I think that compared to Earthships, you're exponentially making a much better system. Um, you're approaching it right. Um, I, I get what you're saying about California. For Californians, it, the, the eco seems to take precedence over ROI in all cases, and that's all they think about. 
uh, you walk out of California and the rest of the world doesn't really think like that. I mean, it, you've got to have something that's affordable and usable and available in your area. And what you're doing with the earth bags, I, I love it. I mean, I follow um, a couple called the Green Team Project or something like that in Arizona that built an earth bag home. And I, I love watching their work. They built this huge cistern. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but yeah, um, yeah. They've done some really cool work in, in how they've worked with earth bags and you're on the right path. Uh, I really think you're on the right path on how to develop that. Um, I wonder myself, and I've seen things similar, but not quite, if it's possible to actually make a simple machine to fill earth bags or earth bag tubes that might work even better with what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> I understand yeah, this I've, is more technology, I've, but it's simple technology. I've seen I've seen a machine uh, um, on online on YouTube. I'll send you the link. Um, maybe we can put it into this video. But basically, it has like a it's like a little little truck that picks up scoops up this stuff, mix, and it has like a auger screw thing, and then the sandbag is put to the side and just shoots out sideways. The the the, the, the R um, sandbag method can be sped up if it has a little stand or with yeah. two, two wheels. That uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen those guys with red, red Hyper Adobe bags. Hyper Adobe doesn't use barbed wire. Super Adobe with white polypropylene bag uses barbed wire, so it's an extra step. But uh, it, it does take quite long, Scott. I do think the future is in 3D printing the walls, because you know the printing happens in two two walls side by side. Yeah, so the I've walls seen machinery are... that does that, and it's fabulous in what they're doing. Uh, yes, but expensive. So the walls have been need to transfer mass through the laws of thermodynamics. We fill them with like um, with mass, like sand, okay? Or, or a bit of stabilized earth or clay. And, and stomp it 10 centimeters at a time, so don't pop yeah. those walls up, okay? But the walls that we want to stop the transfer of heat, we will uh, put uh, that uh, polystyrene, uh, air creep mix, or whatever insulative we can find. But there is one more technology that we didn't speak of. And that is, I actually want to uh, jump onto my other computer um, and show you quickly uh, a wood chip using Jean Payne's composting method. Oh, I love this. I'm actually planning yeah. myself to get a wood chipper for my tractor next year. Um, the amount of heat you can get from these type of systems is absolutely fabulous. How it's, much um, heat? My understanding from what I've looked at, and I haven't built one yet because I'm waiting, hopefully this year I'm going to get a wood chipper for my tractor. I've got a Kubota. Um, is that they're going to produce 140 to 160 degree Fahrenheit heat with a large pile. When I say a large pile, I mean um, 20 yards or more. Um, and it should do it for about a year, at least a year, um, which is beautiful because in a climate like ours, you can put it together in the fall um, what's nice is if you're cutting firewood, there's so much branches and, and extra that's just wasted. And it's usually just burned in a burn pit or something like that. And this can all turn into heat. The other thing that, from my understanding, the science of it, when looking at it, is that you can get more than twice the amount of heat out of a piece of wood if you compost it versus burning it. And I know a lot of people are against burning and going on there. Whether you burn it or compost it, you're going to release the same amount of carbon dioxide back into the environment. But the reality is, um, it, it comes back with other trees, so it's it's a slower green. It's not the same as burning fossil fuels that are coming out of the ground. It's um, they well, don't really consider you, burning firewood all that terrible for the environment. But yeah, but you know what I heard? You can actually get the same amount of temperature. Uh, and heat and for the same duration if you compost the stuff versus just burning it but the main difference is that at the end of the sea you know cold season you either have a pile of ash which you almost can't do anything except spread yeah, it then you've got extremely valuable compost you can extremely use it you, can you have it. a lot of it and a lot of it so yeah. so this is the home that i wanted to share with you it's my latest design and I'm uh, uh, so I'm just left my chair. So I'm just can can you see this? Yes. Yeah. So basically, I know it's a bit funky. I'm actually designing a school for children, um, and I thought I'd design it really in a different place, in a different like more or funky place. Uh, design. So it has a large cool. greenhouse. 
large greenhouse with lots of plants that are able to grow here. And that's a walkway. Okay, let me just add a bit of the sugar of color. Um, then that's this method I showed you out of wood that I built in the uh, oh, wow. northern, northern uh, very cold minus 30 area. So that's wooden straps like, um, yep. I'll show you a picture again just now. Um, yeah, uh, and basically this is the composter. This is the compost, and I've made it in a way that uh, uh, it can be easily accessed. So if you need to get it out with, uh, with maybe if you have a little machine or you don't, or you have a little pickup truck that you can load compost. Unless you would wood chips, we'll need to throw some uh, a top, maybe a top with some, because um, wood chips are already insulated. But basically- Wood chips, a little manure, it. mix it up, put some pipes in between it's, it, and you're laughing. Maybe not even mix it up. Maybe just throw it in layers, just in layers, like uh, one foot of this, one foot of that, one foot of this, and then throw a little warm blanket, waterproof blanket, and that yeah, will work. Right. Just, just by touching this wall, it's going to transfer heat into this see, space. See, there hasn't That's been an enormous it. amount of research in the John Paul stuff, but so it's something that I, I want to do myself. But what I love about it is if you feed that into a radiant floor, it's coming in at right around the temperatures you want your radiant floor to be at. You know, if, if you're using a radiant floor like I'm doing right now with a wood boiler, the floor gets, it's fine for a greenhouse, but it gets too hot for a human to walk around sometimes. Whereas, you know, the 140, by the time that dissipates out, it's out for heating with a radiant floor. Okay, okay. So so what you're saying is by, by having a good temperature inside of our um, system, it can be the same similar temperature to our, uh, to a comfort temperature that we need. Yeah. That that compost pile, it's absolutely genius, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way to heat. And I'm going to tell you, as someone that's heating with wood right now, okay, wood is nice, and I get a lot of good exercise out of it, but it's a lot of work. I'm actually putting up a video. Um, It's almost done. I don't know which one. If I'll get this one or the other one first. That shows how much work I have to do on a weekly basis to feed my wood boiler. I got to stuff it two to three times a day. Uh, I have to cut all the wood. I have to bring the wood here. Um, I have to dig it out of the snow when the snow comes on it. Then I got to chop it down. Uh, there's a lot of work that's involved uh, in the wood boiler. You got to take the ash out of the wood boiler every two weeks, which is a lot of work. Um, are you aware of the system? Pile. Are you aware of the system We're called on bone floor? South Korean, uh, um, you know, South Korean on bone system. So uh, they use these little channels. Let me. Uh, let me see if I can pull a little picture. Um, Those were fairly ancient too, weren't they? A couple hundred years old. Yes, very ancient. But the but the beauty is, listen, you're gonna you're gonna fall off your chair now. This guy, in northern climate, minus twenty, he yeah. claims that um, once you heat this thing up, it's gonna pop up on the screen now. Once you heat this thing up, Scott. Uh, yeah. He only stokes the fireplace every two weeks. Every two weeks. Taking a thermal mass to the extremes of what it can do, and I like the idea. I mean, it's not about just generating the heat, but it's also about being able to store it and use it effectively. Yeah, and I know what you're talking about, this metal wood boiler. We're stoking ours every one hour, okay? Because Ouch. it's metal... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's metal and it's so inefficient. We, we're right now, and you know, it's not our home. So, uh, but the bottom line is that every one hour, I'm piling that thing full of wood, eating from morning until night. And morning time, we wake up, it's cold again. It's just so inefficient because there is no mass. And having no mass. Well, well the is next question is what kind of wood are you burning? Because I've gone through this and I find that, well, right now I got access to some oak. Oh my God, it changed my life. When I was using um, things like, I was filling that damn boiler every three, three, four hours. It was terrible. With oak, I can do it twice a day. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to the type of wood that you can get. Now, not a lot of people want to give you access to oak, but I got really lucky because a local farmer, we went through a drought for two years and had a big section of oak trees that all started dying. Going at the center, so they weren't really good for anything else other than an outside wood boiler. So I got very lucky with that. But... I tell you, I don't ever want to use anything but oak or oak equivalent type hardwoods that have that kind of energy density to them. Because when I use other types of wood or smaller pieces of wood, like you're saying, I'm stoking and I'm putting wood into the thing constantly. 
but when I put big chunks, and when I say big chunks, I'm talking logs that are at least a foot across and three feet long. I'm only doing it twice a day, and I like that. <laughs> yeah, so so this system is called Ondol, O-N-D-O-L, okay? And it has a, a, a thick floor. Um, it's almost like a rocket last heater. Yeah, but it heats up the entire floor through those right. channels that you've seen. Uh, I mean, you can do those channels out of bricks. You can do them out of uh, um, uh, sandbags. Uh, yeah, so that's that's something we're going to be playing around with. So I want to do uh, your type of uh, uh, radiant heater system on the uh, with um, radiator in one room, and I want to do this on doll system in this main one of the main I rooms. Love and to just, see that in just test. I'm going to be the guinea pig in this because I don't have all the answers, just like you. We're trial and error. Yep. Yeah. It's, that's a beautiful system in what you're looking at there. I mean, I, I like it's almost it, it's using like a rocket mass heater. It's turning the floor into the big mass for the rocket mass heater. And uh, smart. I'm just worried with that. The only concern I have with that is, is the floor going to get too hot? If you uh, that's you've got to get into it. If you overstoke it, okay, because you know you can give it power and keep on heating it and heating it. Yes, it can get very hot. It won't be so hot that it starts burning the wood, but it'll be very like it'll be too too warm. It'll be too warm because yeah, yeah. because the law of thermodynamics, mass heats mass. Yeah. So the air yeah. might be cool, but <laughs> your body's cells start warming up. Which because is one of the reasons why I love the compost pile because it gives you a steady amount of heat, and when you have a a, a fixed amount that stays steady twenty four hours a day, it, it's nice. It, it, it's easier to manage with a thermostat because you just turn turn on and turn off the pumps for have that fairly cheaply automated to give you the right temperatures you want inside, especially for a home. For a greenhouse, you can have a little more variance, but for a home, people, you know, they don't want to have big, big shifts in their temperature. So there's so much to try, but th this, I'm building two rooms uh, this summer. Uh, this this green room behind me, that uh, that one, the main one, out of, stra out of strats, out of wooden slats, and one side room, which is going to be a ferrous cement, just a sheet of metal uh, as a formwork. Um, and then I'm going to try two different methods in, in two different rooms. So, so it's really great. I'm going to be to following connect. that. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Hugely yeah. And I think we should do another call where we can discuss those other questions that we, did, we didn't touch on. But right now, it's been good to just share about the thermal oh, dynamic. I'm, I'm really happy you reached out and got a hold of me. We should get back in touch probably in the fall when we've played with a few more of these things and we can talk a little more in depth of what we've done and where, where we've gone with them. That'll be lovely, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. Good.